In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And with your spirit. So as we continue this Easter season, we are starting to hear from John chapter 6, which is the beautiful Bread of Life discourse. This is one that I encourage you sometime. We're getting it in pieces, but to read it all at one sitting and understand how Jesus is leading the people to ultimately that very, what many would say would be a scandalous truth, that he's saying, eat my flesh, drink my blood. And we're going to see that progression. This is one of those steps there, that the real presence of Jesus Christ in the Eucharist is at the very core of our faith. And as St. Peter would say in one of the later passages in John chapter 6, Lord, where else can we go? You have the words of everlasting life. And so let's ask the Holy Spirit to open our own heart during this time within our country as we celebrate this National Eucharistic Revival, that it might be a time for us to go deeper into the powerful gift of the Eucharist. Brethren, let us acknowledge our sins and so prepare ourselves to celebrate the sacred mysteries. I confess to Almighty God and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have greatly sinned in my thoughts and in my words, in what I have done and in what I have failed to do, through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault. Therefore I ask, Blessed Mary, ever Virgin, all the angels and saints, and you, my brothers and sisters, to pray for me to the Lord our God, May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. Let us pray. Grant, we pray, Almighty God, that putting off our old self with all its ways, we may live as Christ did. For through the healing paschal remedies, you have conformed us to his nature, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the Acts of the Apostles. Stephen, filled with grace and power, was working great wonders and signs among the people. Certain members of the so-called synagogue of freedmen, Cyrenians and Alexandrians, and people from Cilicia and Asia came forward and debated with Stephen, but they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which he spoke. Then they instigated some men to say, we have heard him speaking blasphemous words against Moses and God. They stirred up the people, the elders and the scribes, accosted him, seized him, and brought him before the Sanhedrin. They presented false witnesses who testified, this man never stops saying things against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him claim that this Jesus the Nazarene will destroy this place and change the customs that Moses handed down to us. 
All those who sat in the Sanhedrin looked intently at him and saw that his face was like the face of an angel. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Blessed are they who follow the law of the Lord. Blessed are they who follow the law of the Lord. Though princes meet and talk against me, your servant meditates on your statutes. Yes, your decrees are my delight. They are my counselors. Blessed are they who follow the law of the Lord. I declared my ways and you answered me. Teach me your statutes. Make me understand the way of your precepts and I will meditate on your wondrous deeds. Blessed, Blessed are, are they, they who follow the law of the Lord. Lord. Remove from me the way of falsehood and favor me with your law. The way of truth I have chosen. I have set your ordinances before me. Blessed, Blessed are, are they, they who follow the law of the Lord. Lord. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Glory to you, O Lord. After Jesus had fed the 5,000 men, his disciples saw him walking on the sea. The next day, the crowd that remained across the sea saw that there had been only one boat there, and that Jesus had not gone along with his disciples in the boat, but only his disciples had left. Other boats came from Tiberias, near the place where they had eaten the bread, when the Lord gave thanks. When the crowd saw that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they themselves got into boats and came to Capernaum looking for Jesus. And when they found him across the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered them and said, Amen, amen, I say to you, you are looking for me not because you saw signs, but because you ate the loaves and were filled. Do not work for food that perishes, but for the food that endures for eternal life which the Son of Man will give you. For on him the Father, God, has set his seal. So they said to him, What can you do, what can we do to accomplish the works of God? Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God, that you believe in the one he sent. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. So as I mentioned at the beginning of Mass, we are in the sixth chapter of John. This is actually the chapter that the famous scripture scholar Scott Hahn would be converted through. When he was doing, if you read his story, he discovered the fathers of the church he discovered the, the ancient theologians that knew the apostles, 
and were writing and commenting on the Scripture. So they were closest to the source. They were learning from John himself, from all of these apostles, and he was getting great stuff. He was doing a whole, a whole thing on the Gospel of John, and his congregation was like excited. They're like, wow, we've never heard this stuff. This is so deep. And he's like, well, you know, he didn't tell them where he was getting it from. And then all of a sudden, he got to John chapter 6. And then he just kind of stopped the Bible study and said, all right, we're just going to jump to the book of Revelation right now. And people are like, wait, what about, let's keep going with John. He's like, no, you really don't want to hear what I have to say. Because when he went into the fathers of the church, he started realizing that all of them were talking about the real presence of Jesus in the Eucharist. This is not just a representation. It's not something that you just use to remember a wonderful thing that God did. It's not something that reminds you of His presence, but it is Him. Just as in the road to Emmaus, when they see Jesus celebrating the Eucharist, breaking the bread, their eyes are open, they recognize Him in the breaking of the bread, and He vanishes from their sight, but He's not gone. It's this beautiful way of saying He's really there. And so we're looking at this great chapter, John chapter 6, and we're in the first third of it right now. So we've heard previously, we have the story of Jesus um, feeding the, the 5,000. We hear that recounted in the other Gospels as well. But in John's Gospel, it talks about after this, they're so excited that he's done this, and the Messiah is the one who is going to be the one that will give bread, who will feed his people. And they want to take him, they want to carry him off to be king. And he knows they're going to take him for the wrong reason, to be just this earthly king, so he, he runs away from them, he hides. And ultimately, he will then send his apostles across the, the sea. They're in a storm, and then Jesus comes to them walking on the water, saying, don't be afraid, it is I, and gets them to the shore. And that's why in the gospel today, the next day after that nighttime storm, the people are looking and saying, well, we only saw the apostles go or Jesus' disciples go, and there's still a boat here, but where's Jesus? And ultimately, ultimately, Jesus, you know, he sees them come. He's, he then says to them, after they say, Rabbi, when did you get here? They're looking for him. They're seeking. And he says, you are looking for me? not because you saw signs, but because you ate the loaves and were filled. And that's what we're going to talk about today. They're coming because they ate loaves and were filled, but not because they saw signs. Now, the word sign, a lot of times in English, we don't really know what to do with this word. Sometimes it gets, it gets, it means symbol, it means, okay, here's a sign for something, it's representing something, it's not really the thing itself. And so when we say, ultimately, the Eucharist is a sign, all the sacraments are signs, we get confused if we don't understand what that word semeon means. That's what it means in Greek. But this is actually what sign means in a biblical context. So don't think English right now. Think the world of the Bible. A way of understanding this is not so much this is something that you can see that reminds you of something else, but the very thing that you see when you come in contact with it, it is like a portal that leads you into the invisible. It is something visible. Baptism, for instance water poured over, you see it. But as you look upon that visible reality, 
if you have wonder, like a child, this is why Jesus says, only if you have the heart of a child can you receive the kingdom of heaven. When we enter into that sign, we're actually brought through to experience the reality of the invisible, the mystery of new life in Christ, in baptism, for instance. A way of thinking of this as well, when we think of sign, is to think about in the ancient world, when they would look up at the stars, they didn't necessarily understand the astrophysics and astronomy and all those different things. And we might say, oh, they're primitive, they don't really know a lot, but listen to their very beautiful understanding of how they understood the stars. And this is actually where we get the word desire desidera from the stars. They understood that there was, in a sense, the firmament above and the firmament below, like, in a sense, water, and the sea was divided, and there was this covering, and the water was up here, and the water was down here. We hear about this in the book of, Re or the book of Genesis. God created the one up here, called it the sky, the heavens, and then the earth, or the sea. And so when the ancient world would look up, and at night they would see stars, these little print picks, they would look at it and they would say, this is a, in a sense, a hole in the covering over the earth, that there's something glorious on the other side. It's kind of like the, the, the famous uh, movie Moana, where it's like, how far I'll go, that sense of like, on the horizon, there's something calling me. And those stars, there was this hunger to, in a sense, touch those stars and to go through the star to be able to see all of the powerful light that you're only getting a tiny little pinprick of its glory. Isn't that a beautiful way of looking at the stars. And the very word desire comes from that sense that when we desire something, we're wanting to enter into it. We want to be wed to it. We want to be in communion. And so that is a way of understanding sign. It's not merely just a representation that says, okay, this is something that just kind of reminds you of something. But it is like those stars that as you look at it and it shines upon you and your heart is drawn to it, as you reach out and touch it, it pulls you in to discover this mysterious world of the invisible. A, a beautiful literary version of this is for anyone who's ever read the Chronicles of Narnia by C.S. Lewis. There is one of the books called The Voyage of the Dawn Treader. And you have this painting of an old Narnian ship. And the children are looking at it. And they're saying, it's so beautiful. It just seems like the waves are moving. It just seems like the boat is rocking. And as they're just so captivated by its beauty and they're entering into that visible sign, they start realizing, wait a minute. The boat is actually moving. The waves are actually moving. And then water starts coming out of the painting, and ultimately they get brought into the world of Narnia through the painting. So again, these are just different ways of understanding when Jesus says, you're looking for me not because you saw the signs, but because you ate the loaves and were filled. And you can hear his sadness there. They're coming after him. They're, they're excited. But they're coming after him just wanting to stop at the sign and just eat that. So the sign of bread. Think about what bread signifies. It is strength for man's heart in the Bible. Think about what wine signifies. It cheers the heart of man. So one is touching upon the need 
to have something to feed us, to stay alive, to keep on the journey. One also to say that man's life is not merely meant to be just a drudgery, but wine is the sign of the wedding feast, of celebration, of cheering the joy of man's heart. This is how bread and wine are understood in the Bible. And so Jesus very wisely takes bread and wine and he says look at these and now i speak into both of these realities and i say this is my body this is my blood and it's not merely just him saying this is something that reminds you of me but in a sense he's gone this is what we mean by transubstantiation bread was there But Jesus, who is the word that created with the Father and the Spirit out of nothing, can certainly go into the very fabric of reality, change the substance, put himself there, kick out the substance of bread and say, sorry, I got this, push it out, and yet still leave the appearance, the mask, in a sense, because he wants us to remember what bread signifies and to hunger, the very thing that will give us life, that we're starving for. And he says, yes, in the physical world, this is what will remind you, what will make your taste buds water and your stomach churn saying, I need this for life. And I'm putting that in front of you because ultimately if you touch that sign of the appearance of bread and the appearance of wine, just like the stars or like the Narnian picture, you touch that reality, the cheer, the wedding feast, and sooner or later you're going to find yourself sucked through the appearance and come face to face with the living God, saying, this is not just bread. It's not just wine. But mysteriously, you've been brought in at the very depth. It's my heart, my heart given for you, my heart, my love, my mercy alone will feed your soul. Remember, Jesus says this against the devil. Man does not live by bread alone. That's what the people hear. They're just like, just give us the bread make everything well, just fill my belly, and that's all that I need from you. And Jesus is like, I'm here for something so much more. I'm here to show you that the bread is not going to satisfy you, but my word, my Eucharist, will satisfy the deepest longing of the heart because our deepest longing we need, and children know this, We need love more than food. If we don't have love, being unconditionally loved, known, seen, in the depth of our heart, if we starve there, no matter how much we get fed physically, we're going to be hollowed out and spiritually zombified from within. And there are so many of our brothers and sisters in the world that maybe have so many things, but maybe are starving and hollowed and dead on the inside because they've never known love. And that's why the message of mercy is so important, the message of divine mercy. Jesus Christ comes into the starvation of our darkness and he says, here's my heart. And if you think about all of the Eucharistic miracles that have happened over the centuries, a commonality that you see is when Jesus says, you know what, I'm going to take this mask away. Yes, this most of the time this appearance of bread is here, but sometimes I'm just going to pull it aside to show you who's really there. A lot of times that Eucharistic miracle, what seems to be bread, then is seen to be human heart tissue. Jesus is giving us his heart. 
and he's telling, as he said to St. Faustina, tell aching mankind to snuggle close to my heart. There I will fill it with peace. So the Lord wants to draw you in. He's given you the sign of the Eucharist, not as a representation, but as something that will help us go from the visible to the invisible, to the appearance of bread and wine, but to touch it and realize we are sucked into an adventure far more glorious and beautiful, and one that is a, just a foretaste of the beautiful wedding feast of the Lamb in heaven. And this is the good news. And now let us stand and bring our petitions before the Lord, who is rich in goodness and mercy. That the Lord may raise up holy men and women for the priesthood and religious life. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That God may look graciously upon nations and people in conflict and grant them peace and goodwill. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer that all who have separated themselves from God may be given hearts of repentance and the desire to return to God's loving arms. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That the Holy Spirit may continue helping each of us gathered here to grow in our ability to love and serve God. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That all who have died may find peace and rest with all the angels and saints in our Lord's loving care. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all the members of the Association of Marian Helpers and the Confraternity of the Immaculate Conception, both living and deceased, and for all the intentions they have entrusted to us, as well as all those who call the right to us, may the Lord favorably hear their prayers and strengthen them in faith, hope, and love. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, we ask all of this. Through Christ our Lord, amen. amen. Pray, brethren, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. May the Lord accept this sacrifice at your hands for the praise and glory of his name, for our good and the good of all his holy church. May our prayers rise up to you, O Lord, together with the sacrificial offerings, so that purified by your graciousness, we may be conformed to the mysteries of your mighty love, through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with 
up your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and just. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation at all times to acclaim you, O Lord, but in this time above all to laud you yet more gloriously, when Christ our Passover has been sacrificed. Through him the children of light rise to eternal life, and the halls of the heavenly kingdom are thrown open to the faithful. For his death is our ransom from death, and in his rising, the life of all has risen. Therefore, overcome with paschal joy, every land, every people exalts in your praise. And even the heavenly powers with the angelic hosts sing together the unending hymn of your glory as they acclaim. Indeed, holy, O Lord, the fount of all holiness. Make holy, therefore, these gifts, we pray, by sending down your Spirit upon them like the dewfall, so that they may become for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. At the time he was betrayed and entered willingly into his passion, he took bread and, giving thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice, and once more giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The mystery of faith. We proclaim your death, O Lord, and profess your resurrection until you come again. Therefore, as we celebrate the memorial of his death and resurrection, we offer you, Lord, the bread of life and the chalice of salvation, giving thanks that you have held us worthy 
to be in your presence and minister to you. Humbly we pray that partaking of the body and blood of Christ, we may be gathered into one by the Holy Spirit. Remember, Lord, your church spread throughout the world and bring her to the fullness of charity, together with Francis, our Pope, and William, our Bishop, and all the clergy. Remember also our brothers and sisters who have fallen asleep in the hope of the resurrection and all who have died in your mercy. Welcome them into the light of your face. Have mercy on us all, we pray, that with the blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with blessed Joseph, her spouse, with the blessed apostles and all the saints who have pleased you throughout the ages, we may merit to be co-heirs to eternal life and may praise and glorify you through your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him and with him and in him, O God, almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. Amen, amen, amen. At the Savior's command, informed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy, we may always be free from sin and safe from all distress as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant your peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And with your spirit. Let us offer each other the sign of peace. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, Lord I am, I am not, not worthy that you that should you enter should under, under my, my roof, roof, but only, but only say, say the, the word, word and my soul, and my soul shall, shall be healed. healed.
peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give it to you, says the Lord. Alleluia. Act of Spiritual Communion and Thanksgiving. My Jesus, I believe that you are present in the most blessed sacrament. I love you above all things, and I desire to receive you into my soul. Since I cannot at this moment receive you sacramentally, come at least spiritually into my heart. I embrace you as if you were already there and unite myself wholly to you. Never permit me to be separated from you. Amen. In the Diary of St. Faustina, paragraph 984. My Jesus, I understand well that my perfection consists not in the fact that you command me to carry out these great works of yours. Oh no, the soul's greatness does not consist in this, but in great love for you. O oh Jesus, in the depths of my soul, I understand that the greatest achievements cannot compare with one act of pure love for you. I desire to be faithful to you and to do your bidding. I am making use of my strength and my reason to carry out all you are asking of me, O Lord, but I have not the least shadow of attachment to all of this. I do it all because such is your will. All my love is drowned not in your works, but in you yourself, O my Creator and Lord. Let us pray. Almighty, ever-living God, who restore us to eternal life in the resurrection of Christ, increase in us, we pray, the fruits of this paschal sacrament and pour into our hearts the strength of this saving food through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go and announce the gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. St. Michael the Archangel, Archangel, defend us, defend in, us battle. in battle. Be our protection, our protection against, against the wickedness, the wickedness and, snares and snares of the devil. Of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly, humbly pray. pray. And do thou, thou Prince, Prince of the, of the heavenly, heavenly host, host 
by the power of God, cast into hell Satan and all the evil spirits who prowl about the world, seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. I'm Father Chris Aylor of the Marian Fathers, and I want to tell you about a grace I hope you don't let pass by. As a member of the Association of Marian Helpers, you can receive all the graces of our masses and prayers and penances just like you were a Marian priest or brother by decree of the Holy See. It doesn't cost anything, and it takes but a few seconds to sign up. Please visit micprayers.org or call us at 800-462-7426. God bless you.